Thank you very much. I'm going to focus on the UK because that's what I've done the most work on. Although, as you'll see from my affiliations, um, I'm also the Honorary Secretary of FIGO, which is the Federation of International Gynaecologists and Obstetricians and the Chair of the Wellbeing of Women Charities. So I'm wearing a lot of different hats, but I thought what I would do now is complement what Robin was saying and focus more on the UK. So the thing that I want to impress upon everybody about is how important it is in the field of women's health to adopt a life course. My specialty is the only one that deals with everything that occurs to women from cradle to grave. And that's why I've always found it so fascinating. And I think it's also really important to start off by reminding us all that women's health um, has a, a transgenerational and, and a cross-generational um, aspect to it. So what happens in every part of a woman's life cycle accepts, uh, affects the next one. And that's really, really important for us to remember. Now, this is the traditional view of women's health, and this, was the, this is how my generation of doctors were trained to work, basically in a disease intervention service. So we tended to deal um, or divide up women's health into childhood and adolescence, and then the reproductive years, and then the post-reproductive years. And for the most part, apart from some enlightened screening programs, we waited for the girl or the woman to come along with a problem, and then we tried to deal with it. And as many of you may know, I've been particularly interested in my clinical and academic career in the causes of miscarriage and the causes of stillbirth um, and the reasons why pregnancies fail. And I think what it's fair to say is that over 25, nearly 30 years now, my group um, looking at recurrent miscarriage have demonstrated that what's really, really crucial about understanding pregnancy and the various adverse pregnancy outcomes is to understand that most of the blueprint is established by the end of the first trimester. So the quality and depth of the way the tiny embryo's placenta implants into the mother's womb is actually going to determine whether she has a first trimester miscarriage, a second one, whether she has a baby that's growth restricted or she develops preeclampsia or she develops, delivers prematurely or has a stillbirth. So that's a really crucial point that I wanted to emphasize. I also wanted to emphasize that more recently we've had, well in the last decade or so, we've had an understanding that actually preconception is really, really important too. But I don't want to go into too much detail there. But for anyone on the call who has suffered miscarriage, because it is the commonest complication of pregnancy and is non-medical, I suggest you get a copy of this very cheap paperback from Amazon, which will tell you all about the causes of miscarriage and how we can treat them and alleviate the problems. I think it's really important. I'm a firm believer that if you give women the information they need, they're usually most reassured by being back in control of what's happening. And before I finish talking about miscarriage, I'm delighted that we have at Imperial a National Miscarriage Centre, which was launched back in April 26, so six years ago. We're on our second tranche of funding. And you'll see some of my colleagues down the bottom here, these mugshots, Phil Bennett, um, myself and Tom Bourne from Queen Charlotte's. But we're also collaborating with the University of Birmingham and uh, the University of Warwick and Coventry. And I think that's really important. It was a hard won battle, this, to try and stop people doing things in their back garden and actually collaborating. And I think what we've demonstrated with having the Tommy's National Center is that we get much faster generation of study results, which of course means rapid translation of findings into practice. And then obviously prestige to leverage other money, but most importantly, I think, is the succession planning to ensure we've got the next cadre of experts and we can develop a sustainable legacy. So I'm delighted by that. and very pleased that we've now got another five years of funding. But now I come to the real crunch of what I wanted to talk about, and that is that I believe that women's health in the UK has been underfunded for decades. And one of the problems we've got, and remember we have something that the rest of the world envies in our NHS, but we spend about 104 billion treating disease and only about 8 billion on preventing it. And I think we need to actually change that. Now, historically, the emphasis on women's health, as uh, both Deborah and um, Robin have pointed out to us, was on pregnancy. Now, please don't get me wrong. I, I think that pregnancy is incredibly important, but it's a relatively small part of a woman's life course, if you look at this life course diagram. And the thing is that pre-reproductive and post-reproductive women are often invisible. And if you get to meet someone who's rather enlightened and says, oh, yes, but then they become post-reproductive, 
you're giving the impression that life stops at the menopause, which is at the average age of 51, which I don't think is true, as of speaking as a, a woman in her 60s and who's definitely menopausal. And then if you're very lucky, you might get some cancer screening investigations or you might present with a problem. As Robin has just shown us so eloquently, actually, women are not going to die of cancer. The vast majority will die of cardiovascular disease and the complications of frailty and osteoporosis. So my light bulb moment came in 2010 and I went to a conference and listened to Michael Marmot talking about his report, Fair Society, Healthy Lives. And of course, as an obstetrician, I was fascinated by him talking about how the life course approach was essential and how disadvantage starts before birth and it accumulates through life. But what really struck me was his comment, which I hadn't understood before, was that healthcare services that I've been trained to deliver contribute only a third of improvements to life expectancy. And it's all the other things, the social determinants of health, which are the really important things, that it's all too easy for something as ivory tower as an academic health sciences centre at Imperial to forget about. And I hope Deborah, she's nodding at me, I think she agrees. But that was the year 2010 when two things happened. First of all, social inequalities became talked about and more people talked about how the first nine months of, pregnant, of your life in utero shapes the rest of your life. And I want to emphasize that I do believe that. The other thing that Michael Marmot said was um, something that was obvious, I'm sure to most people on this call, that the poor tend to be unhealthy and that there's a very significant social gradient health but the thing that I found most interesting and which I've learned now is absolutely key to this is that the best health and life expectancy doesn't follow wealth, it follows secondary education. So with all those points in mind, let's now look at some of the public health challenges for UK women in 2022, remembering that we are one of the few countries in the world who has a national health service free at the point of delivery. We are the most obese nation in Europe. We still have one in six pregnant women smoking, despite the fact we know it harms not them, just them, but their baby too. We know that sexually transmitted infections are rising, mostly because young women can't get access to uh, sexual reproductive health clinics. But I think the thing that may surprise you if you didn't know it is that contraception is increasingly difficult to access. So we have a high unplanned pregnancy rate, and nearly half of pregnancies are unplanned. We've done a wonderful job in reducing teenage pregnancies, but it's still the highest in Europe. And we have an abortion rate, which is rising, not in young women, but in older women who tell me that they can't access long acting reversible contraception. And then if we add to that um, maternal mortality, four times higher in black women, how can that be in a developed country? Mental health, 15% of women experience postnatal depression. One in four of our workforce is menopausal and many of them give up because they say they can't talk about it. And one in three women over the age of 60 have got some form of urinary leakage or incontinence and they never talk about it because it's just too embarrassing. So we know that reproductive health has far reaching impacts on many, many health outcomes. And I can't, haven't got the time to talk to you about all of them, but I'm going to focus on just one or two and remind you that since 2014, women's health has been affected disproportionately by the public health funding cuts, which really are, I think, a travesty to women's health. So why do we need a women's health strategy? Well, as Robin has always said, 51% of the population is female, they number nearly half of the UK workforce, and they carry out the vast majority of unpaid caring roles. And when I was president at the RCOG, I was the bugbear to two secretaries of state, uh, Jeremy Hunt over here and Matt Hancock over here, bugging them all the time about we need a strategic health, women's health plan. And they kept pointing to me to all the wonderful monies they put into maternity and maternity safety until one day, completely exasperated, I said to Jeremy Hunt, but women's health is far more than incubating babies and delivering them. We've got past Margaret Atwood and The Handmaid's Tale. He looked terribly shocked, but at first, interestingly, he did deliver. And so in, and that should read, sorry, launched in November, 2018. In November, 2018, Jackie Doyle Price, who was a conservative MP with the Women's Health Portfolio, and I launched the Women's Health Strategic Task Force. We always felt that it was bona fide because we were invited to launch it on Woman's Hour, um, which always makes things uh, go further. 
So these were our initial priorities, not in clever, terribly clever science, not rocket science at all, uh, but actually dealing with some of the common things that we look after so badly amongst women, and which if we could adopt more sensible strategies for, the rest of the, the global community could adopt those too. So I'm coming back to my uh, life course approach, and I've changed some of the, the markers here. But the point I want to make is that actually women's healthcare needs are entirely predictable. So you know, most women you and I know will have 12 periods a year for nearly 40 years of their life. Most humans we know want to have sex with whomever, I don't mind, but they probably need contraception, the vast majority of them. And yet I've already said to you, we've got a terrible problem. And look here, the stuff that I spent all those years doing, assisted conception and recurrent miscarriage, it's a tiny, tiny part of the equation. And what we've got to do now is focus on all those things in the post-reproductive years, because you and I, Deborah, are going to live for longer as post-reproductive or menopausal women than we were reproductive. And that's thanks to all the social changes. So this is the Better for Women report that uh, I published in December 2019, um, which focused on the life course approach. And instead of talking about individual diseases, we wanted to talk about accurate access or access rather to accurate ed education and information prevention and empowering women. And we criticize the fragmentation and access to services. But importantly, and I think one of the reasons why we got some traction with this was that for every criticism, we provided a cheaper, more cost-effective solution. But the primary uh, recommendation was the creation of an NHS-led women's health strategy. And you will have noted that it's now two and a half years later, but we do have uh, all the plans for a women's health strategy, and we hope to appoint an ambassador very soon. So I'm going to just take two quick examples and show you just how silly it is that we don't get this right. Now, contraception is the single most cost of an intervention in healthcare. No one would disagree. It's unique in, in the breadth of its positive outcomes. And we've known for over 20 years that reducing the number of unintended pregnancies by increasing contraceptive use in developing countries has reduced maternal deaths by a staggering 40%. So why is it that in 2022, contraception is so difficult for women to access in the UK? Now, just tilting towards the global, I want to remind you that in this year, more than 300,000 girls and women are going to die because they were made pregnant. and Most of them don't have any access to contraception. So um, for many women in the global south, which is on the, on the blue side of my slide here, they have farewell parties during pregnancy instead of baby showers at 36 weeks. So in the developed regions, the risk of dying because you're pregnant is about one in 7,000. The best place in the world to be pregnant is Sweden, of course, 17, one in 17,000. But if you go down, further down at the global south, we get to Chad and the chance of dying because you're pregnant and you've got no control over it um, is about one in eight, which means you're more likely to die because you were made pregnant than you are a finishing secondary school. But I think one of the problems that I wanted to emphasize here is that we're still classifying maternal mortality as events that happen in the birthing unit. This is a very first world birthing unit, as you will see. And I'd argue that that's too little, too late. And I'm very, very great supporter of one of my heroes, Mahmoud Fatala, a fantastic Egyptian man who was head of Figo um, in the 1990s. And he said, this is nearly 25 years ago, women aren't dying of diseases we can't treat. They're dying because society has yet to decide that their lives are worth saving. So rather than look at a list of all the global health teaching about why do these women still die in the 21st century of maternal mortality, I think we need to focus very quickly on the real determinants of why women die. It's about political will and female literacy and gender equality. And I think women's health, therefore, there's a need to prioritize it for every nation. And we've all got a role to play in advocating for change. All it means is you've got to change the hearts and minds of people and persuade them to act differently. So this is a, a launch of the um, report, a women's health agenda, funded by um, Stephen Dorrell and his public policy projects um, group that I was opening in, uh, in the Commission on Status of Women at the UN very recently in March 2022. And we took a whole list of topics of under-resourced and poorly understood. And you will see as well here at the bottom here is the gendered lens, uh, the policy mismatch and the, uh, the, the enormous holes or lacunae in our data. And of course, violence against girls and women, which remember during the the pandemic has escalated in every single country in the world. 
And I mention that UN meeting because, of course, we are in the Sustainable Development Goals period for the 15 year period. And as it's 2022, we're getting to halfway. And I think the one that I want to most um, carefully emphasize is number five, which is ensuring gender equality and empowering all girls and women. Because as Ban Ki-moon, who launched them back in 2016 said, uh, when we empower women, we empower communities, nations, and the entire human family. I'm going back to Mahmoud Fatala, who's looking a little older there now, and this is the two of us sharing a platform back in February 2019. I haven't seen him since the pandemic, sadly, but I've got plans to go back. And he always talks about how empowering women by education and information is the enabler to achieve this. And I think this is the, 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 the conference at which uh, it went down in, uh, in most, um, most headlines in most newspapers in Egypt. Empowerment isn't available in pharmacies. Women have to find alternative sources of supply. And I think we as healthcare professionals, whatever our roles, are one of those um, sources of supply of empowerment. So I'm going to finish with Flavia Bustrio's um, quote from the WHO, the right to health is a human right. And the health of a nation, I firmly believe, is determined by the health of its girls and women because they actually influence everybody else in society. So as clinicians, I think we're uniquely placed to ensure gender equality. And I rather like this beautiful slide that one of my daughters gave me, uh, because I think when you mix up, when you combine uh, men and women in equal quantities, you really can reach infinity. So I hope you will agree with me that we need a, with a women's health strategy in this country, because when we make it better for women, everybody benefits. Thank you.